Good evening, everybody. Good to see you tonight. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 33? Now, last week in our study, we saw how that Jacob had been in Paddan Aram, which is in Mesopotamia, living with his um, wife's brother Laban, working for him. Twenty years had passed. Of course, Jacob had gone there because he was running from Esau, who he had cheated out of his blessing. And uh, so the heat was on, and, Jacob, and Esau said, I'm going to kill that guy. Okay. I've had it. I'm going to kill him. So Rebecca finds out what her son is planning, tells Jacob, tells him to go to Laban's for a few weeks till things cool down. Well, 20 years passes. 20 years passes. Things haven't gone so well at Uncle Laban's. Um, as it says, Laban's countenance wasn't as it had been toward Jacob. That's because God basically took away all Laban's wealth because he had cheated Jacob so many times gave it all to Jacob, so Laban wasn't too happy with Jacob anymore. So Jacob has to take his wives and kids and, you know, under the cover of darkness, start running for home. God says, I want you to go home. I want you to go back to the land of your inheritance, the land of Canaan. In fact, God told him, I want you to go back to Bethel. That was the place where Jacob really met God on his way to Padan Aram. But now God says, get, get back to Bethel, basically. And uh, so he starts on that journey, and uh, Laban finds out about it and takes some guys, and they catch up with him. And, but God spoke to Laban in a dream the night before. says, look, don't you dare say anything good or bad to him. Leave him alone. So Laban had no choice. So uh, Jacob now continues his journey back to Canaan, and he sends some servants out to kind of scout the way. And uh, he knows. He's got to face Esau. And so he wants to kind of send some servants before him to kind of, you know, prepare Esau, let him know he's coming, you know, and so on. And uh, the servants come back to Jacob. They said, yeah, we saw him. By the way, he's coming to see you. He's got 400 guys with him. So Jacob was pretty upset about that. He figured he's coming to get me. That's it, right? So he has a pretty sleepless night the night before. In fact, he wrestles with the Lord Jesus Christ in a pre-incarnate appearance. And we saw how it ended with the Lord having to cripple Jacob to force him to stop running away every time, to force him to stand still and trust God instead of just running all the time. Never gave God a chance to really show him he could solve his problems. He could be there for him, protect him, and so on. So finally, God, the Lord Jesus, cripples Jacob. And as he cripples him, he changes his name to Israel, which means broken, governed by God, controlled by God, that kind of thing. Well, the day has come for him to meet his brother. Verse 1 of Genesis 33, Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were 400 men. I can only imagine okay, what Jacob must have been thinking at that moment. You see your brother, the one you've defrauded, cheated, the one who said 20 years earlier he was going to kill you, and now here he comes, he's got 400 guys with him. That doesn't doesn't sit too well, it's a little scary. But uh, I want you to notice that after God has changed Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel, right? Jacob means heel catcher, schemer, conniver, that kind of thing. After the Lord cripples him, it changes his name to Israel. Governed by God, controlled by God. Uh, Look how he's already reverting back to Jacob, because he's in the flesh. In fact, Jacob is called Jacob twice as many times as he has called Israel from the time God renames him. He's called Jacob 45 times after that. He's only called uh, Israel 23 times. Unlike Abraham, when God changed his name from Abram to Abraham, that name pretty much stuck the whole time. But as I said last time, whenever Jacob is in the flesh, the Holy Spirit refers to him as Jacob. When he's in the spirit, then we see him called Israel. Now, before we get too hard on the guy, okay, it's easy to kind of point the finger and, you know, tisk, 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 and Jacob, you know, how can he, come? he can't walk with the Lord, you know, like me, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, we have a little bit of Jacob in all of us, you know. 
Um, we love the Lord. We want to walk with Him, and we often do, but we get in the flesh, don't we? I mean, if you say no, I like to have a little camera on your dashboard when you're in traffic on the expressway. I'll tell you that. All right? Anyone says, no, I never get in the flesh, uh, I, I, I would challenge that. But we, we, we have a tendency to fall into the flesh at times, and when we do, it's the Lord's way of telling us, look, you're not as um, free from these things as you think you are. So you think that you've arrived, don't think that way. Because there's still a lot of flesh in all of us. Now, verse 1 again. Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there was Esau coming with 400 guys. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Boy, there's no guessing where you stood with Jacob. He made it pretty obvious, okay? I mean, he doesn't know... If when Esau gets to them, he's going to begin to slaughter people. So what does he do? He puts his least favorite people in front and works his way back from there. So the concubines go in front with their kids. And then he puts Leah and her kids after that and saves his favorite wife, Rachel, and you know his favorite son, little Joey, who was just a baby at this time. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. And... Um, I kind of think this was the beginning, though, of the animosity that Jacob's other sons would eventually um, have towards Joseph. Of course, it wasn't just this incident. I think this began it, though, where they realized that Joseph was favored. Uh, Not the oldest, but he was definitely the most favored one. And, of course, we're going to see later on in the story how that... uh, Jacob did favor Joseph, actually put him in charge of his older brothers, and then when uh, Joseph had a couple of dreams and shared them with his brother, thinking they were going to be excited about that, they weren't so happy, and that's when they sold him to slavery. But I think it probably all began right here. Now, as Jacob puts all these people in order, in order of how much he cares about them, to his credit, he goes in front. He's a shepherd of his family. So he goes in front, leads the way, verse 3. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. I get the impression he started this a couple of blocks from Esau. Just started bowing. Take a few more steps, bow, a few more steps. You know. uh, look, it was customary in the Middle East to, um, as a greeting uh, that one would give a king or really any dignitary that outranked you and was obviously more important to you. This was how they would do it. They would bow numerous times. The only problem was that God had told Jacob, as we've already seen, and even before Jacob and his brother Esau were born, God told Rebekah that the younger, Jacob, would outrank his older brother Esau. And that would wind up that Esau's descendants, the Edomites, would wind up serving Jacob's descendants, the Israelites. Now God told Jacob that himself again. God repeated that to Jacob when he was old enough to understand uh, that, uh, that uh, he was going to rule over his brother. God had, in his sovereignty, uh, chosen that uh, Jacob would be uh, greater in rank, in the sense that he would be um, part of the messianic line. And so, in that regard, he was going to be greater than his older brother. But it seems here that he's going against God's will for his life, because he is fearful of his brother. Remember what the uh, writer of the Proverbs says in Proverbs 29, verse 25? The the, uh, fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be saved. Remember that. The fear of man brings a snare. We are to respect people uh, in authority over us, but we're never to fear anybody because God is with us. And as long as we're walking with him, In doing what he has told us to do, I don't care if we're martyred. We don't have to fear anybody. We know what's going to happen after we die. But uh, when we start fearing man to the point where we start watering down the message, letting, uh, uh, putting kind of a a bushel over our light because we don't want to look um, at work like a Jesus freak or something like that, that's when we get into problems. That's when we get into problems. So here comes Jacob bowing all the way. Verse 4, but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. 
I think that Esau wept tears of love for finally seeing his brother again. I think jo- uh, Jacob wept tears of relief that Jacob that Esau wasn't trying to kill him. Uh, that might take a minute. Uh, verse 5, And he lifted his eyes and saw the women. This is Esau now. Lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. We do see some growth in Jacob. I know he gets in the flesh quite a bit, even after God renames him. But in the 20 years that he has been away, he has grown. He has grown. We see him giving glory to God, thanking God for his grace toward him. It, the children whom, it's the children, these are the children whom God has graciously given to your servant. Then the maidservants came near. They and their children bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? In other words, remember the droves? Esau wanted to butter up his uh, brother. Excuse me. Jacob wanted to butter up his brother Esau. Because again, he didn't know if this Esau was coming to kill him. So remember how he takes all these animals and divides them into companies or droves. Puts a servant uh, behind each one. And, they, and it says, now put a, enough space between each drove. I would imagine maybe, uh, you know, half a mile even. And, and as each of these droves of animals approaches Esau, Esau was supposed to say, well, what is all this? And the servant was coached by Jacob to say, well, these are a gift from your servant Jacob to his lord Esau. And I mean, there's like 10 or 15 of these droves. Over almost 600 animals or even more that he was giving to Esau as a present in the hopes of buttering him up, right? And so Esau says at one point, what is, what is all this? these companies? You know, what, is, what is all this about? And um, Jacob said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Now, i got to tell you that as I read the account of this reunion... Esau comes across as more genuine and kind-hearted than does Jacob. I mean, Jacob's greeting and all the gifts he gives to Esau were nothing but a way to appease him. They, they weren't really a genuine thing, okay? It's just they were designed to kind of um, appease Esau that he wouldn't kill Jacob. Esau, on the other hand, seems genuinely happy to see his brother and doesn't really want anything from him, all right? I mean... It's obvious that Esau, well, he doesn't have to pretend. Jacob is kind of pretending. He's, you know, all this, my Lord and your servant stuff and all these animals as a gift to Esau. It's all designed to appease Esau so that he doesn't hurt Jacob or his family's, uh, family. But uh, Esau's got the 400 guys. If he wanted to, he could wipe out Jacob and everyone with him at any moment. The fact that he doesn't, of course, indicates that Esau doesn't harbor any of that anger and resentment anymore. It's all been drained away. 20 years has passed. Okay? Um, and yet, guys, I see a softness in Esau. Although, let me just say this. I, I didn't hang out with the guy. Any guy who's rolling around with 400 guys, his own little private army, I mean, you know, come on. They're not doing charity work. Something's up, okay? They're probably a rough bunch of guys. But in this situation, at the very least, he comes across as kind of gentle, kind, sweet to his brother, the brother that had defrauded him. He's, you know, he says, he grabs him, hugs him, weeps. Uh, I don't want anything from you. It's just good to see you, basically. Can you imagine what they had to talk about that's not recorded in the pages of Scripture? They probably went off to the side and did some, some catching up. And Esau probably told Jacob, listen, I want to tell you that while you were gone, Mom died, you know. And um, she loved you, Jacob. Uh, she was asking for you right up to the end. Uh, you know, Rebecca paid a steep price for her part in the deception that she used along with Jacob to deceive Isaac in giving uh, Jacob Esau's blessing. Uh, Rebecca paid for that by never seeing her favorite son again. But they had a lot of catching up to her. I really get the impression that Esau is genuinely happy. Uh, he's grown. All right. Now, here's the thing. I don't think he's gotten saved. His name is basically synonymous with the world. When you see Esau, in fact, the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 11 mentions, or somewhere in the book, mentions Esau. 
and how that he was not a spiritual man. He was a worldly man. Even worldly people can grow. Even people who are unsaved can mellow, right? Uh, even uh, unbelievers can be kind and, uh, and so on. I think Esau grew, um, but he grew as a, as a man, but not, he didn't grow in uh, grace uh, in any relationship with God. Jacob did. And you know what? Say what you will about Jacob. He was carnal, and even after God you know, changed his name and so on, he still gets in the flesh. But Jacob has grown. And the thing about Jacob was he grew in his walk with God. Whereas Esau might have grown as a person, but you know what? It doesn't matter if you grow as a person if you don't have a personal relationship with God to grow in also. So verse 9 again, But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, No, please, if I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face, as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that, please take my blessing that is brought to you. Notice the language there. What did Jacob steal from Esau? His blessing. What does Jacob say now? Please take my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. So Jacob urged Esau and Esau then took the gift. I do think part of the reason Jacob gave all these animals to Esau as a gift, it was his way of saying he was sorry for cheating Esau out of his blessing. And when Esau accepted the gifts, it was his way of accepting Jacob's apology and saying he was forgiven. You see, guys, in that culture, one never accepted a gift from an enemy, only a friend. To receive the gift was to acknowledge a friendship. And we're seeing that here between the lines. It was a cultural thing. So when Esau accepted, and maybe that's why Jacob was pressing him so hard to take the gift. Uh, because he was trying to make amends. He knew he had done his brother wrong. Jacob has grown as a man of God. He wanted to make some restitution. And so he says, please, you know, I'm putting words in his mouth, but I stole your blessing. Now please, take my blessing and keep it. I don't want to be at odds with you. I want to be your friend. And Esau received it. Okay? And that spoke of then everything being patched up. When Jacob said to Esau, Please accept my gifts inasmuch as I have seen your face, as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me, it really goes back to something that happened at the end of chapter 32. Well, again, we were talking about how the Lord Jesus came to Jacob that night before he was going to meet his brother Esau and wrestled with him all day, all evening and all that night into the breaking of day. And again, at one point, the Lord touches his thigh, his uh, hip, throws it out of joint, and now Jacob is crippled. And he names the place Peniel uh, and says, because I have seen the face of God and lived. So the Lord, so the Lord Jacob said, I've seen the face of God and I, I, he's, I've been spared. Okay. Well, now, the same thing is he's applying to Esau as Jacob looks into Esau's face. He declares in verse 10, For I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. And so the idea is that Jacob had seen the face of God and lived, and now he sees the face of Esau, who he thought might be coming to kill him, and would have been justified probably, uh, but Esau spares his life, so it's kind of like his experience with seeing God face to face. That's kind of what he has in mind here. You know, just as I've seen God face to face and live, now I've seen your, your face and you've been gracious to me, you've accepted me, you haven't killed me, and so it's like seeing the face of God again. Verse 12, Then Esau said, Take us, excuse me, let us take our journey, let us go, and I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak and the flocks and herds which are nursing are with me, and if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly uh, at a pace which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. And and Esau said, well, now let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. Let me leave you some some guys to kind of protect you as you make the journey. But Jacob said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth, 
built himself a house and made booths uh, for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth. Um, what's going on? Well, after the reunion, Esau invites Jacob and his family to come back to his home in Seir. I mean, Esau wants to spend more time. He's met, seen his brother for the first time in 20 years. Uh, he's obviously done quite well for himself, and he wants his brother and his family to come and spend some time with him and his family and, and stay there in his hometown and so on. And uh, Jacob says, well, you know what, though, but I've got little kids and we have livestock. You know, they can't keep up with the pace of your men lest they die. So here's the deal. You guys go on up ahead and I'll follow behind you and, and we'll catch up to you. Okay. And Esau tries to say, well, let me give you some guys at least to stay with you and kind of you know, watch. No, no, no. No need. Just go ahead. We'll catch up. Well, as soon as Esau and his men disappear over the horizon towards Seir, which is to the south, west, uh, southeast, Jacob turns around and heads in the opposite direction to the northwest to Sukkoth. He lied to his brother. He, he didn't have any intention of going to Seir to spend time with Esau. I think he was still terrified. I, I think Jacob was, was terrified. I think Jacob felt like, well, maybe the guy's having a good day. But I know this guy. He's a hothead. He can wake up tomorrow and be in a bad mood and I'm done. I'm not taking any chances, okay? So he actually goes in the opposite. He, what he does is he's already crossed over the Jabbok River. So he backtracks and goes back and crosses back over to the side he had already come from, okay? To this place called Sukkoth, which means stalls or booths, named because he there built a lot of stables for his livestock, uh, as well as a house for himself. Look, God had called Jacob to to return to Bethel. So it's hard to understand why he doesn't obey God, but goes instead to Sukkoth. And guys, guess what? He stays there between eight and ten years. Now, that, that's a mystery. Something else that's significant. We see him build himself a house to live in, verse 17, instead of living in a tent. A tent, of course, was the symbol of a pilgrim, a sojourner, this is the first time one of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, has now dwelt at a house. All right? The, the, the symbolism was that the tent represented the fact that they were not settling down, that they were passing through, that like we are, we're sojourners. This is not our home. We're, we're passing through on our way to heaven. It's the idea. And um, so I just see this as a step backward in Jacob's walk with God. I mean, the whole thing suggests that Jacob still had a lot of self-will left in him. I mean, he was a man that still wanted to do things his way. Unfortunately, as we're going to see, his family and others would wind up paying dearly for his disobedience. Verse 18, Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. All right, so now he leaves Sukkoth after eight to ten years. And now he enters into the promised land, Canaan. All right, But he stops in the city of Shechem, where he's going to live. When he came from Paddan Aram and pitched his tent before the city. So he comes to Shechem. He pitches a tent there. So he's moved out of the house, back into a tent. And he bought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money, and he erected an altar there and called it El Elohi Israel. Well, at least he's back in the land of Canaan. All right? And yet he wasn't at Bethel. He was in the land of Canaan, getting closer. All right? But he hadn't yet gone all the way to Bethel, the place where God called him back to. And it was, the idea was God was calling Jacob back, not just to a locality, but to a place in his heart that God had once occupied. When, God, when Jacob first met God at Bethel, it was a very powerful experience for Jacob. It signified that it was a turning point in his life. His relationship with God became very real at that point. It would be like when you first met the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, many of you remember, you know, what day it was, where you were, the time. It was very significant because their God revealed himself to you. And you might have grown up in the church, gone to Awanas, but it was something, of course, very special about meeting God in salvation. 
And that's kind of what Jacob was experiencing here uh, or many years earlier. But uh, he, he doesn't go back all the way. He's, it's partial obedience. And guys, partial obedience is really total disobedience. I mean, if you tell you, you know, parents, if you tell your son to take the garbage out and he takes it from the kitchen but leaves it sitting by the back door, doesn't take it outside and put it in the garbage can, do you call that partial obedience? Hooray! Uh, you call it total disobedience. Why Jacob wasn't in a hurry to get back to Bethel again is a mystery to me. I personally think it had to do with him not wanting to completely submit to the will of God. It's just Jacob still being Jacob. I personally think that it shows us how that we as believers can stray from God and backslide. And even though God beckons us to come back, back to that place where we first met Him, back to that place of our first love, total obedience, uh, absolute surrender, that kind of thing. Let me just say this to you, and some of you know this very well. Once you backslide and get back into the world, and the world gets its tentacles around you once again, and you, be, and you spend time indulging the flesh and feeding the flesh on the things of the world once again, it's very difficult to make a clean break, isn't it? It's very difficult. And you hear the voice of God saying, you know what, when are you going to get right? This isn't where I want you. When are you going to come back to me? When are you going to get back to church? When are you going to start getting back to my word? When are you going to start getting back to the place where we first met each other? And God begins to tug on your heart. And you've been there. But depending on how long you were in the world, how long you had backslidden, Jacob had been gone 20 years. It's hard. It's hard. And even though part of you wants to get back with God, sometimes it takes a while. You're kind of dragging your feet. Remember a lot? How we read it in chapter 19. When Lot separated himself from Abraham, a very spiritual man, his uncle, Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. Twenty years later, he was now living in Sodom as an older man. And the Lord sent two angels to Sodom to talk to Lot, to tell him, look, we're going to bomb this place. We're going to destroy it. You need to get out of here. Get your wife, your sons-in-laws, your daughters. Get out of here. Remember what it says in uh, chapter 19, verse 16? While Lot, what? Lingered. While he lingered. He didn't want to let go of the world. The angels had to grab him and drag him out of Sodom. You know, what does God have to do to drag us out of the world? I, I don't know. Sometimes things that are pretty severe. I have seen people that have walked away from God and gotten into sin so deeply that it, it took something very um, profound to pry the world away from them. But God loves us too much to let us go on in that way. He, he, will, he will come after us. All right. Um, and yet, look, I want you to notice it, this. Jacob's dragging his feet. He's not really wanting to come back to Bethel with all his heart. Again, uh, at least 10 years has passed now. From the time God says get back to Bethel, uh, Bethel um, he's still dragging his feet. And yet, I guess he kind of wants the world in God, in a sense. Yet he still wants to look very spiritual. Isn't that how it is? We don't want to acknowledge we're being very carnal. You know, in our partial obedience, we want to look very spiritual. So what does he do? He moves into Shechem now. It, at least it's in the promised land. It's not total obedience, but at least he's getting close. Bethel's about 20 miles away. And what does he do? He builds, he moves back into a tent, because that's spiritual, right, back then. He calls himself Israel, because that's a spiritual name God gave him, builds an altar, and calls it El Elohi Israel, the God, the God of Israel, my God, because he's calling himself Israel, okay? God's my God. Look, let me just say this. God isn't interested in our religious activities. I'm convinced God doesn't care if you go to church. I mean, don't get me wrong. He cares if you go to church, but only if your heart is really in it. He doesn't care if you go to church Worship him. Call yourself by some title. I'm a born-again Christian. Or I'm a Calvinist. I'm a Lutheran. Whatever it might be. If you're not giving God 
your whole heart. You're not really walking in full obedience. Partial stuff, you know. And then we try to say, well, God, at least I'm going to church. See, I'm going to church, Lord. Well, yeah, but you're, you're, you're not living rightly for me in this area or that area or whatever it might be. You, you know, I don't have your, your heart. You're giving me lip service. Look, if it's not rooted in obedience, it's just meaningless religious activities. And that's how many people have deceived themselves in our culture. Uh, they are far from God. They are living in sin, yet a lot of them still go to church or they'll watch uh, Christian TV or they'll listen to a Christian, uh, some Christian teaching on the radio. And in their minds, that's, that's, it's okay. I mean, I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I'm, I'm not totally in the world. You remember when God told Saul, first king of Israel, to wipe out the Amalekites and King Agag and to take all their animals and to kill them to leave nothing alive. You remember the story, how that Saul went and he partially obeyed God. He captured Agag, didn't kill him, and took the choices of the animals to sacrifice to the Lord instead of wiping them out as God had said. So he's coming back. And God said to Samuel, you go meet him. And so Samuel comes and meets Saul, and Saul's all, he's all happy, like he's done you know, this great thing. And uh, he said uh, to Samuel, he said, uh, Blessed be the Lord God, we have obeyed all that God had told us to do. And Samuel said, If you have obeyed all that God told you to do, why do I hear all the animal noises in my ears, the bleeding of the sheep, the lowing of the, of the cattle, if you've obeyed everything God wanted you to do? Oh, but we have. But we figured it was better to just capture the animals to sacrifice to the Lord rather than just kill them. And what did Samuel say to Saul? 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Translation, obedience is a lot better than religion. God doesn't want religion from you. He wants a relationship with you based on your love and obedience. And that goes for me too. Building an altar to worship God, well, that's great. If your heart is really for Him and you really are trying to live for Him in obedience. Otherwise, guys, again, it's nothing more than meaningless religious activities. Uh, Jacob should have built that altar in Bethel. This was his way of kind of smoothing over his disobedience. Look at Lord, I'm being spiritual. Yeah, but you're not being obedient. Well, verse 1, chapter 34. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Now, Dinah is somewhere around 15, 16, maybe 17 years old at this time. And she's basically a farm girl that was raised in the country, all right? And now she's living in a city, although it's kind of on the outskirts. She's not really in the city. They've, they have bought land right outside the city, but... Very close is the city now. And uh, Dinah, you know, wants to make some city girlfriends, okay? Because I guess she feels that city girls are exciting. I've only known these country girls and uh, mostly my, you know, relatives. I want to, you know, get to know some city girls. Guys, Dinah seems to have been naive, rebellious, and probably ignorant of the ways of the world. Uh, girls of mar marriageable age back then were not permitted to leave the tents of their families or people to go about visiting without a chaperone. That was just common. Okay, that was just that was the way you did it. You did a young lady did not wander around on uh, chaperoned. In fact, the Hebrew term went out there in verse one. You know, Dinah says went out to see the daughters of the land. That's a Hebrew word that implies impropriety. She snuck out, no doubt. All right. When her dad, mom, and brothers weren't looking, when they were probably busy doing something, she slipped out of her tent and she went into the city because she was, you know, looking for some adventure and so on. But uh, the idea is she paid dearly for her naivete and rebellion because she was raped. Verse 2, And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her 
and lay with her and violated her. Notice the verbs. Took, lay, violated. A description of aggravated rape. In Canaanite culture, any women walking around by themselves without the covering of another male family member were always in danger of being raped. In fact, it was almost an advertisement to the men back in those days. If you were alone, then you were looking for it. That's how they reasoned. Of course, in Jewish culture, rape was looked upon as extremely heinous. Extremely heinous. A great dishonor, not just to the, the woman, but to her whole family. Her whole family. You see, guys, theirs was a culture based on honor. Where when one member of the family was hurt or wronged or dishonored or violated in some way, it became, the, the family was honor bound to make it right. To exact vengeance and so on. That was what was motivating Dinah's brothers. Verse 3. His soul, Shechem, the young guy who had raped her, his soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor saying, Get me this young woman as a wife. Sounds like Samson, doesn't it? Uh, I like what one commentator said. He said, and I quote, it was a soulish love. In other words, purely emotional. Okay, It was a soulish love Shechem had for Dinah, not a spiritual or godly love. He loved her for what she could be and give to him, not for what he could be and give to her. His heart is shown in the words, get me this young woman as a wife. It was a soulish get me kind of love. It is possible for a man to be attracted to a woman and to show kindness to her for reasons having nothing or little to do with love. In their desire to connect romantically with a man, women often forget this. End quote. We learn later that Shechem kept Dinah in his house, probably against her will, verse 26 tells us. Now, you remember in reading uh, later on in Second Samuel, how at one point uh, David's son um, Amnon was head over heels crazy in love with his half-sister Tamar. Tamar was a very beautiful gal. Her brother, her full brother was Absalom, okay? Also a very good-looking guy. And, uh, and Amnon was just pining over his sister. He loved her so much. He couldn't live without her. So he develops his, so his good friend, they develop, gives him some input, uh, some uh, uh, counsel about how he can have her. He says, look, why don't you pretend you're sick? And when your dad comes in and says, what's ailing you? Uh, you say, well, I'm not feeling well, but if my sister Tamar comes and feeds me some soup, I'll feel a lot better. And then David will send for Tamar, and then, you know. So that's what happened. And uh, when Tamar came into, she didn't know, innocent young lady, uh, she comes in to tend to uh, her brother, feed him some soup and so on. He grabs her and he rapes her. Now she pleads with him, don't do this. Ask father and he'll give me to you as wife but don't do this this is a a horrible sin in israel you you can't do this but he rapes her and a strange thing happened which really gets into the psychology of some of this stuff okay he was so head over heels in love with tamar as soon as he violates her it says in second samuel 13 verse 15 he turns on her he turns against her so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. Was that real love? No. It just tells you, though, that sometimes strong emotions can feel like love, but it's just nothing more than lust. All right? Now, unlike Tamar with Ham excuse me, unlike Ammon with Tamar, Shechem became consumed with Dinah. Okay? I mean, he can't live without her. He uh, wants to possess her in marriage. No doubt, like every other object, he lusted after growing up that his father gave to him. I, I get the impression he was a prince, right? I get the impression he was a young, wealthy guy who always got everything he wanted. When he saw Dinah, he wanted her, he took her, he violated her, and then told her, Dad, well, let's make this right. You go get her as a wife for me. Look, let me just say this to you. None of this means that he truly loved Dinah. In fact, I think it was a, an example of how much he loved himself. And we've talked about this. You know, I tell young girls all the time. I said, look, 
If ever your boyfriend tells you he can't live without you, he'll kill himself if he can't have you. That's a red flag run for the hills. Because he's not expressing love for you, he's expressing love for himself. See? If he really loved you, he wouldn't want to violate you. He wouldn't want to do anything to dishonor you, like sleeping with you out of wedlock, that kind of thing. So I, I just see here a young man who has been privileged all his life, who has always gotten whatever he wanted, and he thinks he can just take whatever he wants regardless, and he takes Dinah, violates her, and this is going to get him in some hot water with her brothers. Verse 5, And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with... You know, Jacob, you know, again, I don't really um, think much of Jacob as a dad. It doesn't... I don't get the impression he was, you know... Um, so broken hearted over I don't know how much he really cared about the girls uh, his daughters uh, I know he cared about the boys boys in that culture were always more desirable to have a boy than a daughter but I don't really see him if it was me I, I'd go kill this kid you know and then I'd repent but I would <laughs> but I'm telling you I mean you'd have to hold me back from wanting to strangle this kid and Jacob takes kind of laissez faire you know he finds out that Shechem's violated Dinah, holds it back, you know, um, keeps his peace. Verse 6, um, his sons, first of all, uh, verse 5, his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, uh, when they heard it, and the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. But Hamar spoke with them, this would be Shechem's dad, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife, and make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us, and take our daughters to yourselves. So you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you, and Dwell and trade in it and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. Then Shechem said to her father, to Jacob and her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes. I think the ship had sailed with that. Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I will give, a, I will give according to what you say to me. But give me the young woman as a wife. Money's no object. I will, whatever price, name your price. Okay. That had to rub salt. It, it, these guys had no idea the characters they were dealing with. Okay, Jacob was a real conniver and schemer, and his sons were worse than him. But I can just hear Hamor as you know one of those fathers who has always pampered his son, never really corrected him, uh, disciplined him, just gave the kid whatever. I can I can just hear Hamor say to Jacob and. You know, Jacob's sons, just making excuses for Shechem. Okay, I know he forced your daughter to have sex with him, but he's a good boy. He wants to make it right. You know, he wants to marry. In fact, let's give our daughters to each other. Let's all just marry one another and be one big happy family. See, that's going to make everything okay. Well, and meanwhile, Dinah is a hostage in Shechem's house. Okay. Um, look, intermarrying with the Canaanites was not an option. It was not an option, I'll tell you why. It would have defiled the Messianic line and corrupted God's redemptive plan to keep a line pure so Messiah could be born. I think really this whole incident was orchestrated by the devil in an attempt to do that very thing, to pollute the Messianic line with Canaanites who were unbelievers, in an effort to keep Messiah from being born. Uh, it was all made possible, by the way, by Jacob's lack of obedience. It didn't work, but if they were not there, this would have never happened. It was all because of Jacob's carnality, his lack of really wanting to go all the way, uh, obeying God and so on. Verse 13, But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem uh, and Hamor, his father, and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. 
And they said to them, We cannot do this thing, to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition we will cons- consent to you, if you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised. Now, you have to understand something that um, circumcision wasn't unique to the Jewish people. Uh, others, uh, other pagans practiced it at times. So this was not something they were not familiar with. Of course, the Canaanites, the, she- uh, the um, she- uh, Shechemites had not been circumcised, but they understood what it was all about. And um, the sons of Jacob said, look, we, you know, we're circumcised. Uh, we have this relationship with God. He's made a covenant with us. We can't intermarry with you guys unless you men are circumcised as well. Okay, all deception. Okay, verse 16. Then we will, we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we'll, we will become one people. But if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter. In other words, they would call the women daughters. Okay, it's really their sister. We'll take our daughter and be gone. And their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, uh, Hamor's son. So the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. He was more honorable than all the household of his father. Now, that's probably not saying too much. Okay, I mean, one thief might be more honorable than another thief. At the end of the day, they're both thieves. But here's Jacob's sons, motivated, no doubt, by a sense of honor towards their sister and the whole family. They're honor-bound, they feel, to make this right. But they use something very sacred as a ruse. They use the sacred sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham and Isaac and now Jacob, circumcision. They decided to use that uh, as, a again, a ruse to get these guys in a position where they couldn't fight back, okay? To put them in a place where, he, hey, get circumcised and we'll all be one happy family knowing that they w- wouldn't be able to fight once they were circumcised and they were healing, okay? And then they would be, it would be easy to wipe them out. Verse 20, and Hamar and Shechem, his son, came to the gate of their city and spoke with the men of the city, saying, now they got to sell this to the men of Shechem, okay? I mean, you know, Shechem, and the city was called Shechem too, as, as you figured out. Um, but Hamar's son Shechem, the prince, wants Dinah. So to get her, he's got to circumcise himself. But the whole town's got to be circumcised. And they got to sell this now, okay, to the men of the city, all right, which I would imagine was no easy sell. All right, but here's how they worded it. Verse 21, These men are at peace with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For indeed, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters uh, to us as wives. Let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men consent to dwell with us, to be one people, if every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of the city heeded Hamor and Shechem, his son. Every male was circumcised. All who went out of the gate to his city. So the men of Shechem decided a few days of pain was worth it to get their hands on all the wealth of Jacob and his family because they were pretty wealthy. All right? So, you know, now, verse 25, it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain. Throughout the scriptures, you see understatements, okay? One of them was when Jacob woke up the next morning and saw that he had actually married Leah and not Rachel. Behold, it was Leah, one of the great understatements in the Bible. (laughs) This is probably one of those, okay? I, I don't know what they used to do circumcisions, but there was no moils, okay? So you grab a sharp rock, you know, uh, you know, I mean, no anesthesia or Novocaine or, you know, or whatever. OK, uh, three days later, when maybe infections were setting in too, these guys were in pain. That two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. And they killed Hamor 
and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city, because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, and their donkeys. What was in the city, uh, what was in the city, and what was in the field? All their wealth, and all their little ones, their kids, and their wives they took captive, and they plundered even all that was in the houses. Now, guys, this is one of the most horrific, barbaric uh, sins recorded in all of Scripture with regard to God's people. This is one of the most heinous things you will ever read that God's people engaged in. You might say that God is painting his people in this passage warts and all. Okay, warts and all. These were not these were saved men. They were not by any means perfect men. Okay. Now I, I don't know what happened to these two guys. And and I don't know if later on uh, the other brothers joined in when they plundered the whole city. Probably they did. Simeon and, and Levi did the killing. And what started out and I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they, they started out to truly uh, vindicate, to, to you know, take vengeance on Hamor and Shechem for what Shechem had done. But somewhere along the line they snapped. And all of a sudden now it became an excuse to just go berserk. I mean, if they would have came and killed Hamor and Shechem, I would have said, well, okay, maybe that's, that's justice. But all the men, okay, uh, plunder the whole city, take the wives and children captive. I mean, these two guys seem to have snapped. The, the punishment certainly didn't fit the crime. So, certainly didn't fit the crime. But if that wasn't bad enough, when Jacob learns what they have done, his response seems extremely self-centered, self-focused. Verse 30, Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me. <laughs> You have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. There's a lot of me's in there, isn't there? That was one of Jacob's. That's why he was called Jacob here. He was in the flesh. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? Again, Jacob seems more concerned about his own skin than he is for the horrible thing that his sons have done to the people of Shechem. Man, these two guys were brutal. I mean, this is ISIS stuff, isn't it? It's amazing to me. Um, the horror that these two guys inflicted upon these people. And Jacob doesn't, he's not weeping, ripping his clothes in, in horror over what his sons had done to another, to a city. He's just worried about himself. Now, as I just said, Simeon and Levi certainly went too far by slaughtering the Canaanites and looting their city in order to avenge their sister. And guess what? Jacob never forgot it. Turn to Genesis 49. In Genesis 49, uh, Jacob is on his deathbed. He's leaning on his staff and prophesying over his twelve sons. In verse 5 we read, now this is Jacob prophesying after many years after this situation, but Jacob never forgot it. He says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And that's basically what happened. Um, Simeon was eventually absorbed into the tribe of, um, uh, of Judah uh, in the land. Uh, Levi never did inherit any land. They were the priestly tribe, and God set aside cities in the promised land that they were to live in, but they never got an inheritance. Uh, but Simeon and Levi, the second and third sons, forfeited the birthright uh, from this incident. As we're going to see next time, Reuben lay with, is going to lay with one of uh, Jacob's concubines, and he's going to forfeit the birthright uh, by doing that. That then brings the birthright down to the fourth son. 
The first three now were disqualified. The birthright spoke of the priestly line, okay, the spiritual leader of the family in case the patriarch, the father, was killed. It became the, the responsibility of, of usually the firstborn who had the birthright uh, to lead the family, be the family spiritual leader. Uh, but uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi have all disqualified themselves, or at least Reuben will next time. And then it falls on the fourth son, who is what? Judah. Judah. That becomes the tribe through which the Messiah is born. But again, guys, one more time. Very ugly story. A real black stain on the history of God's people. But none of this would have happened if Jacob had been where God called him to Bethel. Listen to me. Obedience doesn't just honor God. It blesses us. When we are in a place of obedience, when we are where God has called us to be, God will watch over us. He'll protect us. He'll provide for us. And the devil won't really be able to get at us. If we wander out from God's, I'll just put it this way, umbrella of protection, which represents his perfect will, and we start getting off into, even if it's not full-blown sin, we're just not where God has really called us to be. We're, it's partial obedience. We open ourselves up for the devil to lead us into situations that can really become a disaster. Things that God wants to spare us from. That's why when the Lord says that we are to obey him, it's not because, as we said Sunday, he wants to limit our blessings and fun in life. Because he wants to bless us the most and keep us and, and, uh, and give us the best life possible. You know, unfortunately, it takes us a long time often to figure that out. Many times years for some Christians to realize that when God tells them to do certain things, it's not because he doesn't love them, it's because he does love them. He wants to protect them and watch over them and bless them. So if Jacob had not, if Jacob had been in Bethel, why he was taking so much time to get there, I don't know. But if Jacob was where God had called him to be, none of this would have happened. And um, as I was reading uh, today, um, some of the great commentators, the old timers, um, some of them passed over this chapter altogether. Just too uncomfortable to deal with. One of them, a great expositor and teacher of the word, says you can't get anything in the way of a spiritual message in this chapter, so let's just move on. I can't, you know what? He said, I can't, I, 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 don't, I can't even put together a sermon that will bless God's people based on the lessons here. Well, I think there's a lot of good lessons here. The biggest one is obey God. Obey God, okay? And be a leader to your family, Jacob, okay? How many fathers are, are dropping the ball because, like Jacob or even like Hamor, they're giving their kids everything they want because they're guilty about not spending enough time with their kids. So whatever the kid wants, because the father wants the child to grow up loving him and not hating him, whatever. Um, but you know what? You're not helping your kids by giving them everything. All, every time they want something, you give it to them. It causes them to grow up thinking they're entitled. And uh, the world owes them things. And uh, that's not a good lesson for any child to learn. So there are some good lessons. Sometimes we learn lessons that are positive. Sometimes we learn lessons where God puts a big circle around it and a line through it and says, look, learn what not to do. See what this person did or these people? The lesson here is don't emulate them. Don't copy them. Do the opposite. Obey God and so on. So next time we'll get into chapter... 35. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. And Lord, there are many lessons that we can glean from our study tonight. But Lord, the biggest one is that you love us. Even when we wander, and maybe we are away from you for years, backslidden. You're still beckoning us to come back to our Bethel. The place where we first found you. The place where we first fell in love with you and made a commitment to you. You're always wanting us to get back to our first love because you love us. And you know that only in that place of fellowship can you really bless us and use us. The world is powerful. And Father, the devil is dangling things in front of your people to distract them, to draw them away from you. 
Give us grace, Lord, to his Christian and faithful on their way to the celestial city in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. When they passed through Vanity Fair and the merchants tried, merchants tried to entice them with their wares, they put their hands over their ears and cried, Keep my eyes from keep my eyes from looking at lying vanities. God give us grace to not look at the world, lust after the world. It's passing away. Its riches are just worthless baubles compared to the true riches of your kingdom. Give us grace, Lord, to walk with you in obedience and surrender and lead our lives in the right path for your glory. Father, we thank you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll stand.